Hello students, welcome to your first video on cells. This one is all about the size of cells. Before we can really get deep into the structure and function of cells, we have to understand that they are very, very small. That just puts them into context with the rest of biology. So by the end of this video, we should be able to compare the relative sizes of molecules, cell membranes, viruses, bacteria, organelles, and cells using the appropriate SI units. So SI, that stands for System Internationale, it's French, um, for the sake of length that we'll use in cells, the system international unit is the metric system. So SI units are just those units that are used the most often around the world. If I take a look at this image, I can see some relative sizes of different things in biology. We go from the atom, we get bigger, bigger, bigger. We get to things that can be seen with a light microscope, then things that can be seen with the naked eye, versus way down here in the very, very small realm. There are things that can only be seen with the electron microscope. All of these things fall into that range of sizes. I want to start by reviewing the metric scale very briefly. Metric scale is really, really awesome because it's based on powers of 10. So it's very easy to convert between different units because all you have to do is move a decimal place and add some zeros. We can just count back and forth. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say I started with something that was 100 micrometers. This little symbol here means micro. Micrometers are something we see a lot of with cells. If I look at this chart, I can see that micro is equal to 10 to the negative 6. So I could take 1 meter times 10 to the negative 6, and that would be the size of a micrometer. I can also see that here if I move this decimal place, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 spots, that would get me 2 meters. So I can go between my base unit and between this micro idea. But let's say I didn't want to go to base unit of of meters. Let's say I wanted to go to millimeters. So I can look over here and I can see that millimeters is 10 to the negative third. The distance between those is a power of 10 to the 3. So I can just move my decimal place. I've got 100 micrometers here. I can start with a miserable decimal place there and I can move it one, two, three different spots and that'll get me to this point one just by moving it one, two, three different spots. If I wanted, I could also write that in scientific notation. If we get towards really big or really small numbers, scientific notation becomes useful. Quick reminder, um, if something's in standard scientific notation, that means it has one um, value towards the front. So here it could be 1 or 1.0, 1 and then I'm going to multiply it by 10 to the power of whatever it is. And so if I'm looking here, oh, this should say millimeters, sorry guys. Um, if I'm looking here between millimeters and millimeters, if I take this decimal place and just move it over, then I can see I moved it one spot. It's getting small, so it's, that's why it's a negative right here. I'll fix that really quickly so it says millimeters. Okay. Um, I could also do that if I started with something that's 100 millimeters. If I'm going between millimeters and micrometers, again, I have a distance of 10 to the power of 3. And so I just take my invisible decimal place and I move it one, two, three spots further, which is where I get to this um, 100,000 micrometers. Again, I can put that into scientific notation. I could take my little decimal place, I could count it over one, two, three, four, five spots until I just have one value in front. And that would give me one times 10 to the fifth. Notice it's 10 to the positive five because this is a large looking number, 10 to the negative one up here because that's a smaller number. So when we're talking about those different sizes, that allows us to compare different things. So if we're looking at a molecule, sort of the average size of a molecule is about a nanometer or smaller. So these are super, super small. Um, nanometers are 10 to the negative 9. If I'm looking at the cell membrane thickness, that's also ridiculously small, about 7.5 nanometers on average. Viruses are a little bit larger. They're going to be somewhere between um, 100 nanometers up to about 200 nanometers on average. Viruses are small because basically all they are is protein and DNA. That's it. Bacteria are actually cells. They're prokaryotic cells and they're between 1 and 5 micrometers. So they're small. In fact, bacteria are normally smaller than the parts of our cells as eukaryotic cells. And so those parts are the organelles. They're about 10-ish micrometers. And then once we get up to our eukaryotic cells, talking about these guys up here, those are going to be generally greater than 100 micrometers. Within each of these, there's definitely a range, um, but when we're thinking about relative sizes, we can put things in order from smallest to largest. Notice in this image right here, 
these are actually on a log scale. What that means, the distance between each one of these is powers of 10, and so it's not a linear scale, it's a log scale, just meaning the atom is way, way, way smaller than the eukaryotic cell. If I put it on a regular linear scale, I couldn't fit them all in this image. In order to see things that are this small, we need to be using microscopes as a tool. And so I just want to do a very quick overview of a couple types of microscopes, a tiny bit about how they work, just so you have these as background. First type is compound-like microscopes. That's what we're going to use in class. Um, it's going to use light and mirrors to um, make things larger. Generally, it's super useful because we're able to see things that are alive. Um, it has pretty high magnification relatively. It just has kind of low resolution, so we can't always get a super large amount of detail. And the reason for that is it's going to be limited by the wavelength of light, and so things that are smaller than that we just cannot pick up using a light microscope. We also will use dissection or stereoscope microscopes. They're also light microscopes. Only this time they have two eyepieces versus just one. They generally have less magnification, they have low magnification, but they, they allow you to see things in 3D, which is why they're called dissection scopes, because often you use them to help with dissection. Um, we could also use a confocal microscope. We don't have one, but if we did, it also is a light microscope, only this time it uses laser light, and it's going to use some mirrors, and it's going to use computers to help with it. Often these things are colored in by the computer, and so if you see an image that's got color like this, it's most likely taken through a confocal microscope. Then we have our electron microscopes. So the previous three were all light microscopes that used light to focus things. The next two use electrons to bounce around and focus things. The first type is a scanning electron microscope. It takes images in 3D, but you can only take things on the surface. You have to coat everything in gold before you can take a picture of it using a scanning electron microscope. So it becomes pretty expensive to use one of these. Finally, we can use a trans transmission electron microscope. Again, these are gonna be based on um, electrons bouncing around. They're gonna give you a two-dimensional view and you have to take things and cut them very, very, very thin because the electrons have to be able to go through it in order to take the image. For electron microscopes, you can't take images of things that are currently alive because they have to go through so much preparation. And so if you're looking at something that's alive, a light microscope will be better. All these microscopes are just good at different things. Here's a quick overview of microscopes in general. We've got our different types of light microscopes that will focus on things using light. We have our electron microscopes. TEM is transmission electron microscope. SEM is scanning electron microscope. Then if we want to go even smaller, we can use probes. Um, all of these, honestly, I don't really know that much about. I just know they're able to take images of really, really, really small stuff. And so if you're interested in technology, you should be looking more into these different probe type microscopes. We're going to be using light microscopes in class, and so we'll get pretty good at these. Um, here's just a couple of the different parts that you'll need to know, and we'll review these in class. So when you're looking at something under a microscope, you're going to see something through this circle. The circle is called a field of view. It's just everything that you can see at one time. As you zoom in using different um, magnifications, you're going to get different fields of view. If you're on low magnification, 40x, you may be able to see something like 5-ish millimeters of space. Then when you zoom in, you'll be able to see less and less, but you also get closer. When you're looking at cells, you're going to be doing a lot of drawings of them, and you always want to say the size that they are, an estimate of it. The way that you do that is first you'll use a ruler or some math to figure out the whole field of view. For example, if I was looking at this one, I could count across and I could see one, two, three, four, plus a little bit there, a little bit there, probably four and a half millimeters across. In this example over here, this whole thing is two millimeters across. So you start knowing that. Then you imagine your specimen, let's say my specimen was just one of these little boxes, I imagine how many of them could fit all the way across. Then once I know how many could fit all the way across, I just take the length of the whole thing divided by the number of cells, and that'll give me the size of a single cell. Oftentimes you'll take that size of a single cell and then you'll translate it into the different metric system. So here's where we have to get really good at going between millimeters and micrometers 
maybe even down to nanometers. When you draw cells, there's a couple different ways to indicate their size. The first thing you can do is say what your magnification is. So you can draw an image, you can say, oh, this was taken or drawn at times 400 power. Um, but you can also put a little scale bar on there. Then you can use this math in order to relate the actual sizes of all of these things. So let's say you were trying to figure out the magnification of this image. What you could do is you could take a ruler and you can measure the size that this is actually drawn at, the size this image was taken at. So let's say this is, I don't know, two centimeters. Then you'll take the actual size. So here it's about one micrometer. So you could put centimeters, micrometers into the same unit, then you could divide and that would give you the magnification. You can also take this same equation and rearrange it to find any of those unknowns. So cells are super small. The next question I come up with is, is why? Why cells have to be so small? And the answer to that has to do with the rate that stuff happens. So cells need stuff inside of them. Um, they need oxygen, they need sugars to do cellular respiration, for example. And in order for that stuff to get inside of the cell, it has to diffuse across the cell membrane. That's the surface area. But there's all this volume inside of the cell. And the relationship between surface area and volume does not change linear linearly. If you imagine the cell as a circle, when it's really small, there's a lot of surface area compared to the volume. As it gets larger, there's less and less surface area compared to the volume. Sometimes the cell will, cells will create something called like microvilli. These are going to be little folds in the membrane that increase surface area. And the reason for that is, is this. Cells are super small to maximize that surface area to volume ratio. Let's imagine we just had this little box that was one by one by one. Squares aren't, I mean, uh, cells aren't squares, but we're assuming they are. The surface area there would be six, and then um, the volume would be one, and the surface area to volume ratio would be six. Then if I took that thing and made it just five times bigger, now my surface area is 150, my volume 125, and my surface area to volume ratio went all the way down to 1.2. So if cells, instead of being like this, if they were broken down into little tiny pieces, then we could again have a large enough surface area to volume ratio to maintain um, diffusion at a rate that allows for life. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for that. We're going to do a bunch of practice. Hopefully you're getting a view for just how small cells are. Look at your arm. Think about the size of your cells.